Um, so our starting point uh, on this project is that urbanisation is radically changing uh, the types of crises we're responding to. And um, as, as Amelia has worked on this study and as, as we started to, uh, to develop it, we saw that despite there's a few notable studies in the area, but we felt the operational implications, as, as Wendy uh, highlighted, of urbanisation to date have really gone underexplored. So that's the gap that this report seeks to address. Um, and on behalf of the British Red Cross, it's really an attempt to, to start to look at urbanisation a bit more systematically about what it means for humanitarian action today. And I think the, the findings in the report should really be relevant not just to the British Red Cross, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, but also to the humanitarian sector more broadly. And that's why um, we're presenting it here today. So in terms of what I'm going to cover, I'm just going to um, sketch out those five areas that Wendy talked about, those five ways forward, um, and, and really um, look at what they mean for the British Red Cross and the humanitarian sector as a whole. Um, but before that, I'm just going to look at the changing nature and scale of risk and vulnerability that we're seeing uh, in urban areas and that's accompany accompanying processes of urbanisation. So... Cities are increasingly faced with the risk of disaster, with significant risk of disaster. We're seeing significant exposure of cities. Um, so this can <laughs> includes the normal natural hazards that we're uh, responding to as humanitarian agencies, so hurricanes, cyclones, floods, earthquakes, uh, and epidemics. But also, it's not just natural hazards, but also man-made and technological hazards that we're responding to that might be <laughs> triggered by natural hazards themselves. So like we saw in uh, Japan's triple crisis, or so-called triple crisis in, uh, in 2011, but also smaller scale incidences like uh, fires in overcrowded settlements um, and, and, and other uh, man-made incidents. Um, and then it's really important not to forget the everyday risks that uh, urban dwellers are facing. And these might be more uh, extensive rather than intensive in nature. So we're not just looking at the large scale disasters, the Haiti's, the the potential in, in Kathmandu for a large-scale earthquake, but also the small and medium-scale disasters, and I think that's very important. So the, the crises people face every day in terms of not getting enough to eat, not being able to afford to go and see a doctor, uh, inadequate sanitation or, or fire uh, in the slums. So indeed, in our work in, in Kathmandu on our earthquake preparedness work, this is something we really saw that working uh, with communities on community-based disaster risk reduction and wider uh, resilience building program, the, the, the more frequent small-scale disasters such as fire, flash flooding, epidemics, uh, storm damage, um, water shortage and so on, um, really seem more real for the communities that we're working with than this risk of large-scale disaster. Um, and that's not that we shouldn't be responding to that, but we need to um, you know, pay some credence to that as well. So this leads on to the next point, um, that compounding this, this uh, changing nature and scale of risk we're seeing, uh, we're also seeing increasing vulnerability within cities. Um, so this is kind of mainly around three areas, particularly poverty and inequality, um, is the kind of the best data we have suggests. There's currently nearly 1.5 uh, billion people living in informal settlements without access, or adequate access, I should say, to basic services. So health, education, clean water, uh, improved sanitation. Um, and then vulnerability might also be heightened by inadequate or unstable income, high levels of unemployment, indebtedness, but also the need for cash to meet basic needs. And I th this is something I'll come back to, the importance of cash and the market economy in urban areas. But health risks too can often become concentrated in densely packed cities where what happens is the, the actual population expansion just goes beyond the capacity of the public health system uh, to meet those needs or beyond uh, not just the Ministry of Health but private sector delivery capacity as well. And then on, on, the, on the shelter side, we're seeing um, the built environment really as, as a major source of vulnerability. So poor design, poor choice of construction systems and building materials being very common uh, in rapidly urbanizing, uh, rapidly growing, and unregulated environments. Um, so here, the kind of the governance and the political economy dimensions 
come in and, and how can we engage with those as humanitarian agencies is, is really a quite a critical question. Then violence and conflict. I mean, we're seeing huge uh, conflict in Syria and the surrounding regions at the moment, which has many urban dimensions, which uh, various agencies are trying to, are trying to grapple with uh, at the moment, looking at their response and recovery plans. But violence itself and other situations of violence, not wouldn't be defined in international humanitarian law as armed conflict, um, need to be responded to as well. So in a lot of disaster contexts we're working in, um, additional vulnerabilities fostered by, by uh, violence uh, are present. So we're seeing these soaring rates of, of violence related to drug trafficking um, and gangs in, in Latin America. And uh, the ICRC, MSF, uh, and others have been responding to those. And they've really been receiving the greatest attention. But as the British Red Cross, um, we're increasingly preparing for and responding to uh, political and election-related violence uh, in urban centres. So the work that was uh, done, we had a, a programme funded by both DFID and ECHO uh, in Nairobi uh, in, in uh, March of this year, and there was a whole interagency process surrounding that, and a very, very complex interagency process. And thankfully, the uh, the expected violence or the feared violence didn't come to pass. But I think that's that's a new departure for the sector, really, in understanding how you you operate in urban preparedness for violence. And then land rights and patterns of settlement. I think the lack of land uh, tenure uh, rights uh, amongst many urban residents is really an issue that renders them even more vulnerable. And many people are living as, as renters or squatters in urban slums. And then with the pressures of urbanisation also associated with, with pressures of climate variability and change, we're also seeing people being forced to move into higher risk uh, urban areas, low-lying areas, uh, hillsides, riverbanks. And again, this is, this is further heightening their vulnerability. So... To come on to the, the five lessons which, uh, which Wendy set out and really are the, the main uh, body of the report, um, as, as Wendy said, the study looks at a, a range of different urban contexts in which we've been working as the British Red Cross or with partner national societies or with the, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent or the ICRC. And so it, it draws on the experience of our staff, delegates uh, and, and volunteers to pull out these five lessons of what we're learning uh, in urban areas, as, wa as well as a wider uh, literature review. Now, the first, the first uh, issue may seem uh, very obvious, and it's around sharpening context analysis and assessments. Um, and this concerns the importance of significant upfront investment, both of time and resources, in high-quality context analysis and assessments. And well, you know, you may say, well, this is, of course, the case in rural areas, too. Uh, but I think given the relative novelty of urban operations uh, for many uh, individual humanitarian workers, but also for humanitarian agencies, we found that robust assessments really can prove vital in ensuring program effectiveness. Um, and given the dynamic nature of urban areas, particularly relating to uh, markets and human mobility uh, in, uh, within urban centres, uh, between urban centres and also rural to urban dynamics. I think having uh, an, a not static, having an iteratively updated uh, assessment plan within programmes can prove really important. And something that's been very useful for us is an approach uh, that was developed by the IFRC, the International Federation, called the Participatory uh, Approach for Safe Shelter Awareness, PASA, which is mentioned heavily in the report. Um, and this was really a, a, an approach where you work with communities, bringing them through the process of understanding uh, risks associated to, to shelter and settlement. Um, and it's a process that's been particularly important in ensuring we have a participatory approach, but also a very accountable approach. And we're working very closely with the community in Port-au-Prince. Um, and, and I'll come back to that. So I think such approaches uh, can help to ensure the whole programme responds to communities' needs. And indeed, uh, in Haiti, the whole direction of the programme was actually changed through this participatory approach, where we shifted from what might have been uh, somewhat of a traditional transitional shelter response to actually um, incorporating a diverse range of recovery uh, and regeneration needs for the urban community relating to uh, wash, to livelihoods and markets. So it's quite... Uh, multi-sectoral and integrated in a, in a single neighbourhood, a single geography. 
And the second point, uh, as I said, I'd come back to, uh, surrounds understanding cash and markets better. And I think this is, of course, something that the whole humanitarian sector could afford to understand better uh, in all contexts, but particularly in urban areas. Uh, you know, people generally depend on the supply and demand of goods and services uh, more than they do on their own food production or fetching water, say, in, in urban areas. So, of course, you know, if, if you look at the body of evaluation uh, data and evidence that's, that's there for, for urban response and recovery operations, and this was a, a similar study done by ALNAP, this lessons paper they did, and, and the same finding came out very clearly, the <laughs> importance of cash and markets in urban areas. But I think we still have some learning to do here. So our experience in urban cash and livelihoods programming uh, in some of these contexts like Djiboutiville and in, in Port-au-Prince has highlighted particular challenges around identifying uh, the beneficiaries that, that we're seeking uh, to target and targeting our assistance towards those who are truly the most vulnerable. And this has forced us to think a bit dif differently about our, our analysis, well, our, first of all, our assessments and our analysis and our response choices. Uh, uh, in urban areas. And I think the key here is that people often have multiple livelihood strategies that they're working through in urban areas. And so tools such as uh, we employ this household econ economic security approach, which builds on the, the household economy approach, which many of you will know, a traditional way of, way of addressing food security. And, you know, we in that approach, you're targeting uh, geographical livelihood zones in which you assume there's one commodity which people people produce. But of course, there's, when there's multiple livelihood strategies, when there's that mobility, when there's that complexity of market interactions, this becomes quite problematic. Um, so it, it's really forcing us to think a bit differently and, and think how we can, how we can understand uh, urban economic response and recovery operations better. And even in, in urban situations where there were clearer groups when we were defining a group as internally displaced persons or refugees, I mean, like the work, uh, our response ongoing in, in Jordan at the moment, our cash-based response, there are additional challenges around um, ensuring that people actually identify themselves given the ongoing political uh, and ethnic tensions and the complexity of these issues within the region. So that's something we have to uh, ensure sensitivity towards and, and include within our programs. Um, the third point uh, concerns, again, the community level, engaging and communicating with complex communities. And, and what we said in the report here is that whatever the nature of the program, understanding the urban community uh, you're working with and engaging with a representative range of stakeholders, a truly representative range of stakeholders, and understanding who's there in the urban environment, engaging in a sophisticated and sensitive way is going to be vital to program success. Um, and also to ensuring we meet the, the uh, beneficiary or, or accountability standards that we're, we're holding ourselves to in our operations. But engaging with urban communities can be particularly difficult. And uh, a review of the, the IFRC's uh, vulnerability and capacity assessment, which is essentially an approach to uh, uh, assessing um, disaster risk reduction um, programs, um, that was carried out in 2011 for us, I found that the most significant problem in applying this tool to urban areas was the lack of an obvious community to work with. It was too overlapping, too complex to set up the traditional mode of programming that was undertaken in rural areas. Um, so residents may live in, in one neighbourhood, but they may commute as a daily labourer into another part of the city, uh, and the way in which they use their time may be less uniform than in rural areas. So here, investment in information technology can be quite a useful tool in overcoming these challenges and improving our communication with communities. So uh, in Haiti, the work the International Federation has done uh, in partnership with the, uh, uh, with the telecommunications firm Trilogy International has really been uh, quite successful. This is a, a project funded by the Humanitarian Innovation Fund um, in, in creating uh, uh, two-way communication platforms that uses SMS text message, uh, interactive voice response technology to try and enhance accountability uh, and engage better with the communities we're working with and increase coverage. And that's really helped to garner the views of, of different groups that, that go often unheard, particularly women who are less likely to respond to the existing um, accountability mechanisms, but also other vulnerable groups who've, who've benefited from that approach. 
Um, the, the fourth way forward for us at the British Red Cross, but uh, this one definitely applies to, to all agencies working in urban areas, is around adapting to the challenges of land and the built environment. I'm not going to say too much about this. I think quite a lot's now, now been written and there's some very good work being done. Um, but the issue of land tenure often undermines sustainable reconstruction efforts in urban areas. Therefore, navigating the legal and political systems that are present in urban areas is often central uh, to ensuring the success of an urban shelter program or an urban, urban response or recovery program more generally, or a longer term risk reduction or resilience building program. Um, and definitely in, for our team uh, in Haiti, which is one of our, our biggest urban programs and has been going on since the earthquake, a very large program, this has been a key issue. I mean, only 40% of plots there are registered with an owner in, in Port-au-Prince. So it's, it's a very challenging issue. And I think this challenge will continue to be faced by other agencies, given the percentage of people living as renters or squatters <coughs> in urban areas. Um, and therefore, we're inevitably going to find ourselves in, in difficult uh, discussions about land rights, the role of landlords, uh, legal protection for landless people. And really, like a lot of other urban issues, the question is, is this really uh, an issue that humanitarian agencies should be engaging in? Where do we move to work with other actors? Where do we draw on the competencies and skill sets of others? Um, this is something the, uh, the IFRC has been working on through its disaster law program, uh, and they've got a set of legal experts looking at uh, regulatory barriers to post-disaster shelter, exploring different uh, potential solutions in different contexts. But this is, uh, of course, related to, to governance and, and the sort of patrimonial arrangements and, and land rights structures in different countries, and therefore it's a particularly sensitive issue for different national societies within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement uh, to engage on, um, given that they are an auxiliary to their governments uh, it functioning in disaster management and emergency response. So the final point, the final way forward, uh, links to what the, the point I was just making about partnering with local groups and institutions, understanding uh, what's there. And, and before we were just discussing, Wendy mentioned the, the capacities of different actors. I think a lot of urban response and what we can learn is, is really looking at not just the challenges, and there are a lot of challenges, but also the opportunities and the innovations and the different ways of working um, that can come from this. So recognizing the likely future scale of disasters, the increasing intensity and frequency of many disasters driven by natural hazards uh, and, and issues of, of urban violence or climate change that, that are driving the scale of disasters, it's clear that partnerships are going to be essential to ensuring effective response in urban areas. Um, so here we can think about municipal authorities, local government agencies, uh, national disaster management authorities that we can be uh, working with and should be a key contact point, I'd venture, for all uh, operational agencies. But also the private sector, uh, civil defence, a lot of interesting partnerships that could be taken forward. They often have... Uh, implications for perceptions and perceptions of principles, but that's something uh, you know, which needs to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And something we argue for in the report, and it actually um, is highlighted in, in Francois's work, is, is looking at a geographic approach uh, to uh, coordination in urban areas. And that's quite an appealing one, given that within uh, the clusters or other sector-based modes of coordination, uh, many potential public and private sector partners are actually absent. I mean, we have, you know, WFP has brought various agencies into the emergency telecommunications cluster, but really they're not present in the way they should be, and we're not drawing on the different skill sets. So understanding how we may work within a geographic mm -hmm. approach and what we've called in Haiti an integrated neighbourhood approach um, is really, really very important uh, for, for ensuring maximum impact of our operations. So just to conclude, I think um, unlike other global humanitarian trends such as climate change, for example, urbanization uh, is not only changing the intensity and the frequency of the disasters uh, we're responding to, but it's changing the very places in which we're working. It's changing the whole landscape of humanitarian action. And I think that, that is really important to recognize and see just what a challenge this is posing for us. Um, so as the British Red Cross uh, and other humanitarian agencies will increasingly have no choice but to work in urban areas. I think that, that's clear. If we're going to uphold our commitment to the fundamental principle of humanity, we will have to work in urban areas. 
And so hopefully these, these five ways forward are identified in the report and these wider issues of institutional adaptation uh, that we're presenting will be of interest uh, not just to our partners in the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, um, but to all of those agencies uh, and other actors or non-traditional actors uh, engaged in humanitarian action today. Thank you very much, Sam, for that very clear and interesting presentation. <clears throat> I mean, just to recap those five points again, um, the first one was about sharpening context analysis and, al analysis and assessments in what are increasingly complex and dynamic uh, urban environments, understanding cash and markets better, because urban economies are, are very much cash-based. But I think one point too, Sam, is that urban areas aren't isolated from rural areas. Mm. And so understanding the linkages, this is something that the report draws out, is also very important. So not looking at urban areas in isolation. Um, engaging and communicating with complex communities, both in terms of who is the community and then what sorts of tools and approaches do you need to use to really uh, understand who you're dealing with. Um, adapting to the challenges of land and the built environment, and Sam went into some detail about the, the difficulties of understanding some of the land tenure arrangements and dealing with those in, in these emergencies. And also remembering that sometimes landlords are vulnerable too. And so really making sure that one understands what the context is in that particular situation. And then finally, engaging with urban systems and partnering with local groups and institutions. And as Sam said, that includes not only the government and authorities, but also civil society and private sector actors. And looking at, at also other actors besides the humanitarian ones who really need to be engaged. So thank you for that. That was really very interesting.